All right, uh, here we go. We have the bridge between Ottawa's finest and Toronto's uh, finest uh, right now. You, so how are you doing today, man? I'm good. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, thank you for coming by to the lens of Yashu for the very first time and all that. You know. And even just like meeting uh, each other like at your EP release party and like just presenting like a lot of like dope music that you've uh, had so far too like it was like a dope experience and you know it made me like interested like in that sense to have you on here you know and then also with um, everything else uh, going on too you know like just like realizing your story right now like you tend to have like an interesting story and you've been doing this like for a while now you know. 100%. I've been I've been doing it for a while. Um, thank you for pulling up to the EP release shoot, by the way. I hope yeah. you had fun. Yeah. Um, did you get to taste any of the juice? Yeah, the juices were actually uh, pretty good so far. You know, like um, I think I've had this like uh, one juice. Um, I think it was like more like a ma like a cranberry or like mango type thing or like a celery type thing. Yeah, they had the two types. Shout out to Ase Juicery. Yeah. Ase Juicery for sure. Um, and also, you know, just like reaching out, like, you know, when I just uh, found it out from you, like more from the message and more from everything else too, I just had to do like my research uh, to, to, uh, for a bit and like, you've, like, you're not like really new at this at all, you know, you've been here like doing your thing for a while too, but like, yeah. Ottawa based, but then you just moved to Toronto for a bit and like now, you're making waves like either way right now, you know, which is like pretty interesting, you know? It's like... You know what it is? I've been doing it for a minute, but it's to what level I've been doing it. So I think the level that I'm doing it now is very different for me. And that's what makes it feel like new and refreshing. But yeah, I have been going at it for a while. But uh, yeah, it's levels. It's definitely levels. Hey. Well, you know, this is it, like your first time uh, right now on TLY. So I just wanted to get into your story for a bit too. So. Lens of Yashu. Yeah, Pretty much, man. So you were born in Bulgaria, that's correct? Born in Bulgaria, yeah. Raised in Ottawa. True, so um, you were born in Sofia, Bulgaria? Or? No, that's the capital actually, but it's uh, a place called Elin Pilin. Yeah, Elin Pilin, Bulgaria. I had to meet a couple Bulgarians while being out to... I used to call it Elin Pelin, but it's Elin Pilin, Elin Pilin, Bulgaria. Yeah. So, and like, uh, growing up in Bulgaria, uh, and like in Ottawa too, um, so like, the area that you grew up in, uh, in Bulgaria, and like, the area that you lived in in Ottawa, like, which are those like areas did you grow up at, and what was like the environment like for you growing up, as well as like a childhood, would you say that it was like a very dope experience growing up in both areas, or would it be different? Um, in terms of Bulgaria, my parents actually left with me when I was 10 months old, so they took me and my two brothers by then had been born in prior countries, Libya, Ghana. So when we got to Bulgaria, my parents left with me when I was 10 months, so I don't really have much of an experience in that, but from what my parents told me, there's not a lot of, uh, like, I guess, black people thriving there. It's more so a lot of place, it's a place where a lot of Ghanaians journey to as like a stepping stone to getting here. Some make it and some don't. So you'll go to Bulgaria now and you'll still see some like homeless Ghanaians, but it's because along the route of their journey, they just didn't make it to the finish of either America or Canada. So that's what it's like there. In terms of Ottawa, though, growing up in Ottawa, I grew up in the South End, um, Hetherington to be exact. That was, looking back on it now, it was blessed. It was actually blessed. There was obviously turmoil, different things, but it was actually blessed. It was super blessed. And you stated that you managed to like live in like Libya for a bit and then you lived like in Ghana like I guess like that No, so here's the thing um, My parents traveled a lot before getting here So that had to do with some other shit, but um, My parents literally went from Ghana to Libya to Bulgaria Paris then they came to Montreal first then we settled in Ottawa So in Ghana, that's when one brother was born went to Libya. My other brother was born there Bulgaria, I was born there, and my parents kept traveling, so... Uh. So, um, as like, a Ghanaian, like, in like, Bulgaria, like, in that sense too, like, I guess like, it's just like a weird, like, culture shock, like, in that sense, for a bit too. For, I think for my parents, more so than me, I adjusted pretty, pretty well to life here, but I think culture shock wise, I'd say that'd be like my parents' experience more than anything. Because I, I got what I was fed at home and then I, what I was fed outside of the house in terms of culture. So I was able to take both things in as, as new things. So yeah. the whole culture shock thing wasn't really, I guess, there for me yeah. more than anything. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, no doubt, man. Um, like in Ottawa, like right now, I know like Ottawa, like it has like an amazing like music scene from yeah. CP Records. Like, I don't know if you knew like CP Records back then. So, like, this, you have this history with that, <laughs> this history with that. I don't know if anybody knows Belly's history that deep, but even with CP Records, it's history with that. Yeah. Huge history with that. And like, they had like a lot of like dope artists, like um, Danny Fernandez, yeah. um, I think, um, Masari too. Masari too, and then sure. also uh, Mia Martina. I was thinking um, Sean Desmond too, but I don't. I don't think he was signed to CP. I don't think he was. Sean Desmond was just another Canadian who put on for Canada in terms of music and everything and branching out. But but also uh, with Ottawa too, like they have like a lot of like dope rappers too. With Night Lavelle, Princess Bree, who's actually from Ottawa but relocated to Toronto like a while back too. City of, City of Adelia that you already like know in that sense too. Blue Will. And like a whole lot of like other dope acts like the FTG crew, FT, FTG Metro, like Rest in Peace and all that. Mm -hmm. And then Two Time. So like in Ottawa, like even back then with CP, w was it like a big place for music at the time too in terms of being like industry? Like when, when Capital Profits was doing anything? Uh, like around that time, you know, yeah. No, it wasn't like a huge scene. It was not a huge scene. That's why it was so big when Belly and Masari did their thing. There was not really a lot of... Um, foundation, I guess, for artists to blossom. There was not a lot of platforms, but in terms of artistry and artists being there, I feel like that's something that's always been there. Like the artists have been there. Yeah, if you go down there, you mingle around for a bit, you'll notice the artists and how they do their own art to a level has always been there. Yeah. yeah, and you know, like when he started like your music career, like in Ottawa too. Like I know, like we'll touch uh, more on that. But like when you moved from Ottawa and now Toronto, like what was like the transition? Like you know, just even like moving from like one area to another, or like adapting to like Western culture. You know, from Bulgaria to like Paris to like Ottawa and all that. You know, like as far as like the culture, the attitudes, and much more. For me, the transition was pretty smooth because like I said I didn't have that culture shock but um, in terms of from Ottawa to Toronto that was a bit rough because I kind of came here with nothing um, not even kind of I came here with I think 40 bucks but that's a whole other story uh, luckily I had the homie who I had here I was he kind of took me under his wing for a little bit too like at least a year or two showed me like the ropes of Toronto how to get around job wise and things like that um, hustling a little bit but yeah, the transition I say from Ottawa to Toronto was a lot more rough than Bulgaria to here. But yeah. Damn. Yeah. Uh, no doubt, man. Super unprofessional, my bad. <laughs> nah, no worries. Uh, we'll cut that like from that part too. Like once, like that phone rang for a bit too. Yeah. It could be. It could be. It could yeah, it could be. But like, yeah, yeah no worries. Uh, but like Ottawa, like from Ottawa to, to Toronto, like it wasn't like was it were there other reasons for moving like aside from the music stuff or was that like the main reason like for that bit too so like i don't even know if people know it or even like if people who are even in my inner circle know it but my move to toronto was never because of music um that was in terms of personal reasons like who i was as a person the momentum that was being had in my life i just needed more i needed more change i needed more um situations where it would push me towards getting to know who i was so i needed more situations where i had to figure it out just to know the person that i was because I was at a point in the city, based on what I was doing and how I was moving, um, it got to a comfortable point. Like every decision I would make, I knew what it would get to, I knew where it would lead to, and it was just, I didn't feel like I was making any kind of rigorous change in me. And I needed that, I needed that. It wasn't, it wasn't feeding my soul from what I was doing. But um, I can say one thing, since moving, I have appreciated the city way more, way more. Ottawa is its own beast, Toronto is its own beast. Every city, every place, every postal code every whatever around the city around the world actually is its own beast you know no i'm most definitely man and you know i want to dig deep into like your music too for a bit too so what was like your musical history and background uh, growing up i say um not a lot of instruments there was one time where my mom tried putting me into piano lessons i just wasn't fucking with it at the time which is something that i would say I don't want to say I regret, but I do in a sense because I, I wish I would have stayed in piano. That's like one of two instruments I want to learn. But a musical background in terms of music, I would say my mom growing up was playing a lot of uh, Peter Tosh, Bob Marley, Lucky Doobie. She had the VHSs with their concerts, like a one hour concert playing back to back. 
So there was that musical sense. What I got from my brothers was a mix. So I got the alternative from one brother and then I got the rap and hip hop from the other brother. So the other brother would show me Pac, Biggie. He was telling me about the beef at the time, but he was kind of making me side with the whole Pac side because he was a Pac fan. He didn't really explain to me just the element of hip hop and what was going on as a general sense. And then I had my brother who showed me stuff like disco, MGMT, which helped my alternative side, which also helped me know what samples were, why samples are so important. Um, and then you have my mom playing that classical stuff. Yeah. My dad also had a hand in that too. He had the Michael Jackson VHSs too. So Thriller scaring the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah now like I think with that film music video too, like they even had it like on DVD too and like VHS mm -hmm. on the whole behind the scenes type part because it was like what like an, a one hour, two hour movie of how the process was. Yeah, like, how everything yeah, was. Yeah, like, so it was like very interesting uh, from that part too, you know, and... Classic uh, shit right there, man. Yeah, Classic shit. Most definitely, most definitely, you know. Um, I know that you talked a lot about, you know, being influenced by like Charles Hamilton uh, for a bit too, so... Biggest influence, yeah. probably. <laughs> Biggest influence. So tell me like how you got into like uh, Charles uh, Hamilton uh, for a bit too, you know? Charles Hamilton came about the, the blog era. I was like a super blog era. I was finding out a lot of music. I was on, um, I think it was Pigeons and Planes. I was on Pigeons and Planes a lot. I was finding out a lot of music. Charles Hamilton, I actually don't even remember how I initially stumbled on him. But I knew once I found out about him, I dug deeper into who he was as a person and what his influence meant to me. The only problem I had with following Charles Hamilton is that he was uh, very depressed through his music. And I know that's something people find a connection with in terms of the being depressed and being down. But one thing he never did through his music was have a, I guess, an ending to a story where it's like, like a cutting, for example. You have the depressive features, which also make the best parts of your music. But at the end of it all, you gotta, you gotta transcend that at some point. And I guess Charles never got the opportunity to fully transcend that and have this bossy main career. So he is an influence, me, influence for me a lot in that sense. But at the same time, I see what I can't take from that story. No, most definitely. I felt like with Charles Hamilton, like he was pretty much like one of the most consistent like artists like of that blog era, you know, like he was releasing like a tape like almost every other week or every other month and all that and like... Crazy amounts. And like his sampling level was just as good as Kanye's, if not better. Like if you really take back with like, he might have needed a different sound kit for some of the shit to hit. He might have needed more mixing and mastering. But if you have that type of ear that can see what something could be, you'll know that Charles Hamilton was really, really that guy. Yeah, no, it was definitely, man. And I felt like even in that sense, too, he could be, like, in the same lane as, like, a, a Kid Cudi or Travis Scott, too. Like, even with the right people around him. But I, did, I didn't felt like... I didn't actually feel like Interscope actually like helped him uh, throughout the way too because at that time I think he was uh, still signed uh, with, Inter with Interscope and yeah. then they only just took the hype you know from Brooklyn Girls and all that and that's the thing like you said with the right people around you I'm glad you know your history on Charles yeah. Hamilton too by the way yeah. that's that's crazy yeah. but um like you were saying with the right people around him is the biggest thing biggest thing and I don't think he had maybe the best people around him all the time one thing I can say is Interscope, especially in terms of Jimmy Iovine, from what I know of looking into Charles and the documentary that came out with Red Bull, if anyone can find that online, I feel like Interscope really did try. Especially in terms of Jimmy Iovine, I feel like they really did try with him. It's just, it's one of those cases you can't control. There was no, there was no right way of going about it, no right exact thing to do. But I feel like Interscope, especially Jimmy Iovine, really did try with Charles Hamilton. They really did. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, like in the future, um, who would you uh, like to work with uh, someday musically, you know? There's a ton of people. Jeez, too many people to name. Let me try and name like a few. Um, who would I want to work with musically? If, I was going to say Charles. Charles Hamilton, obviously, but we'll see where he's at when I get to where I'm going. Um... Who else? Huh. That's tough. There's so many people. That's tough. Uh, ooh, that's a tricky one. Who would I want to work with? Kodak? Kodak for sure. Um, 
any like you know grandma artists and all that or like you grandma artists for sure yeah. whoa if you had it okay yeah millions unknown t i'd love to work with the i'd love to work with um think what possible and all that Pasalu for sure, super creative. Slow tie, yeah, yeah. slow tie. Um, there's too many. Dizzy, I'd even want to go back work with Dizzy. Yeah. Wiley and his crazy ass. <laughs> Wiley. Jamie um, and all that. Jamie. Yeah. Jamie, he's a staple in the UK culture. Yeah. Uh, Skepta for sure. Man, um, Stormzy and all that. <laughs> Stormzy, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. And then aside from like the US hip hop, I get Kodak, uh, Dirk, Herbo, and all that. Uh, actually, yo, you know what? Let me look at my phone right now. Look. If I go through my music, recent downloads. Let's see. It's who I'm tuned into right now. 070 Shake for sure. Love to work with. Chef G. Love to work with. Who else? <laughs> I don't have like a huge collaborative list. Aubrey, obviously, <laughs> done a lot for the scene. That would be dope. Abra, Abra's another person. If you can come out of hiding, yeah. give me an album. Abra, Abra would actually be a dream to work with. Yeah. A dream, super dream. Titus too, I don't know if a lot of people know Titus. T-I-D-U-S, that'd be amazing too. True, true. And you know like, we talked about like the Ottawa like music thing back then, so, it was, it's assumed that you started like the career in Ottawa back in like 2015, 2016, is that correct? Around then, yeah. yeah. There, was a, there was a little era before that, but I don't think that, that counts. That was like a mega upload Z-share era, and I was putting out like an abundance of tapes. That's a whole other like story. <laughs> Most definitely. Mm -hmm. And like you had like prior interviews uh, back then, I think when you went to Carlton, I think, and then you had your Gluefest 2016 performance. That, are you talking about that glue? Um, Something magazine. Yeah, something like that. Like you know how cold it was that day. <laughs> it was cold out there that day. It was. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to the interview, but I was I was not comfortable. True. I was one hundred percent not comfortable. It was freezing as hell that day. It was <laughs> Ottawa winter, but yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, so tell me more about like starting your to create like music at around like that time period. Yeah. So around like twenty fifteen. So. 2015, if I could take it back one more year, 2014, I had just gotten out of this relationship that um, kind of broke me a lot in a lot of ways, but don't regret it at all. It led to a lot of good things, um, figuring out who I was. 2015, 2014 and 2015, I put out this project called Sandbox Pride, and at the time, it was what I needed. Um, I didn't have a therapist to get over the relationship, so that music was that therapy for me, and I expressed everything on that project, and that literally helped me figure out who I was, what I wanted, or at least if I didn't know what I want, I knew enough to know what I don't want. That also helped me figure out I wanted to move to Toronto because I needed more experiences, I needed more momentum. Um, the creation for that, like at the time, creating music at the time was literally just trying to express myself fully. I needed a place, I needed a place, I needed an ear, and I knew if I could get this recorded, get it out to people, whether it's 10 people, 30, 50, 100, I just knew I needed an ear to listen at least to my story and try to figure out who can relate. Nah, most yeah. definitely, man. And how did the 2016 Auto Blues Fest uh, performance uh, come about and how was it like performing at that festival for the first time and all that? That was, what I want to say was it was amazing. It, um, I think it, it put my mind in a different place for what could be. Also, that came about from, I did apply. I applied online for the festival, but I also think, I think someone else dropped my name into that whole mix because I think they were looking to support local artists and things at the time, but I'm pretty sure someone had dropped my name in there somewhere. I don't want to just say I applied and it happened, but um, yeah, I feel like someone dropped my name in there. The experience was amazing, not just for me. I think for me, the experience that I took in, what made it dope was the people who I brought with me. I brought like an array of different artists, um, a, a photographer but seeing their experience and how they were taking in the whole festival and how we were treated and from the the set list to uh, your rider and everything like that having a trailer like seeing how my people were taking it in was amazing yeah. it felt good it felt good it felt really good to look around seeing a homie i grew up with 
a homie who's meeting someone for the first time and just seeing how they're all smiling, taking all this experience in. That was the biggest thing for me. That was the biggest thing for me. Yeah, it was more than just me. It was more than just about me. Definitely. I know even with a big like festival like that, like I saw like the clip, you had like a lot of like people like cheering for your music and all that. Like when you performed, like you had that high energy. When I saw the video, you know what's crazy about that though? Um, we were doing like a bit of a sound check. We went backstage and my homie Xander, who was DJing, he came out. He's like, yo, like at first there was not much people there. I went out there and I was like, I think there was maybe 10 to 15 people there. And if you're at a festival, 10 to 15 people in like a venue might look like something. But in a festival, it looked like just the front like line was there. And then right before um, homie was trying to get my tracks for the set, he's like, yo, you're about to be on. I look outside and I see a group. I see people now starting to pile in at least maybe seven rows deep. And it's like people. It's not the craziest amount of people, but you got to understand festival grounds. I've never seen that type of shit. So the people started piling in and I went out there and I was like, whoa, like this is like maybe they might just be out here for the festival. But like the way I'm going to entertain these people, I'm ready. I felt super ready. And it was. That was that experience seeing that right before I went on shifted my mind so much towards a positive place and what could be was amazing. Uh, seeing people pile in was uh, most stuff, man. Um, I don't know if you managed to like link up with like any like big artists like at that time too who were performing at that festival. Like if you ever like saw them, like you reached out, like promoted your music in that sense too. Um, I met up with I seen Earl backstage. That was a funny story. Yeah, that was a really funny story. True. No, I'm just um, so we talked about like what made you decide on like moving to Toronto from there, but did you ever felt like leaving your hometown was like the best for you career wise instead of like blowing up while living in Ottawa and that's it? It was necessary for me more as a person, as an individual more than the music. Yeah, moving out of Ottawa was I feel like a lot of a lot of artists from Ottawa move out of Ottawa to come to TO, Montreal, whatever, because of the music. But for me, it was way more than that. It was more of an individual, personal thing. Like, it was more about personal growth than the music. Music followed after. Because when I moved out to TO, I wasn't even making music for the first year and a half, two years. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it was more than the music. It was more about personal growth, if anything. Right. Because, like, I know, like, in some situations, too, like, a lot of people from other areas, like, they'll, like, stay in their hometown, like, in that sense, too, and then yeah. they'll make a big thing there. But then, a good majority will kind of like head to a big city to see if they could take it to like where they can be. Like a lot of like people from the states and like you know like smaller states would move to Georgia to yeah. California and all that. New York and all that. A lot of those moves are super essential, especially like Atlanta being a hub, yeah. LA. We know what LA is there for. Like New York, even yeah. like let's not forget about New York. A lot of those moves are super essential. But the move I initially made was not even because of the music, but. It definitely does branch your stuff up. It definitely does. Most definitely. And like, you know, it's interesting, like, you know, in that area, like, you know, when moving to Toronto, there, there was like a lot of people like that followed within that route. Like I know City Fidelia like moved to Toronto at one point to focus on the music while like working in the city. And then he talked in an interview where um, he had to do like a nine to five job while still doing like the music thing too. Uh, like Blue Will, real, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, Blue Will too, also from Ottawa, like had to develop her career in Toronto as well too, and mm -hmm. kind of like had to blow up from there as well too. So it's kind of interesting, like the Ottawa like alumni that coming to Toronto here, you know. And that's it. There's, a, you know what, you know what I found interesting about uh, Toronto? There's a lot of people here who move from Ottawa to get that same change or momentum, but there's also a lot of people from Toronto who move to Ottawa to get the calm. Yeah. So that, in a sense, was the beginning of me appreciating the city in a way that I maybe didn't before because I was living there for so long. Yeah, um, it's definitely, man. So I want to get more into your creative like, process uh, right now. So what is your creative process when making music? When making music, a lot of my creative process comes from nowadays an idea, literally just an idea that transcends to a voice memo. And then from then I leave it alone until I'm actually ready to record and then I let it blossom. And then I revisit that voice memo and let it blossom. Sometimes if I get like, if I get an idea off a beat, then I, I go and I just record that right away if I can. If not, then I save it to as much as a voice memo. I don't try to save it like in terms of words and lyrics and writing it down because I feel like writing that down doesn't capture that same energy. 
So a voice note, a voice note of maybe two to four lines can give you that same energy and inspiration for a track than writing out a whole track can. Because yeah. writing out a whole track is too, it's too, it's too measured. Yeah, I'm um, definitely man. And I know like you know usually like in the studio too like some people would leave, <laughs> sorry would need to like be lit like either by getting high or like by drinking like a lot of like licks and all that. I've tried that. A lot of times I make a track, I'm either sober or at max. At max I smoke. Yeah, but I don't to get like fucked up before making a song, it won't get made. Yeah, to get lit before a song, that shit won't get made. And if it does get made, it'll probably sound like trash. <laughs> it'll sound like trash. Yeah. Do you feel like in that sense too, like even like being in that element, like being lit, like would help like musically in that sense like not just for you but like for other people like in that sense too or do you feel like people's like processes like when like being in the booth or like when writing a song like it's like different depending on like the lifestyle and all that things depending on the lifestyle in person yeah like are you, are you asking if it's if it's necessary like do you feel like you might have like better content like what I meant is like do you feel like you might get like better content like even being in like a lit element rather than like just being like 100% sober and like it, it like better or not better I think is up to I don't even know who it's up to whether you or the you or the people but if I'm if I could use a good example it's Cuddy so Cuddy was making the best shit of his life when he was lit when he was fucked up the most but I also think that creates the division between a fan and a supporter. So a fan will be there for the littest moments. Like, you know what I mean? They're, oh my God, I'm a super fan. Da, da, da. Like, when Cuddy's lit, you know what I mean? He's, he's being carried in the back of his Escalade by his security and his legs are dangling in the air and all you have a memory of is two J's. His Jordan's just like dangling in the air, you know what I mean? That's when Cuddy was amazing. But as a supporter, like myself, I care about Cuddy more as an individual. So the point where he's at now, I don't feel like his music is what it used to be, but I care more, more about him than, as a human being and the fact that he has a daughter and these things, right? So bringing it back to having it be lit and your littest moment to create the littest tracks, it's like, yeah, some artists might need that, but it's temporary. It's super temporary. You know what I mean? It, it leads to one thing or the other. We all know where that goes. Depending on what your substance is, it's super temporary. And if you want to be, if you want to create a career where it's relying on that, Cool. I mean, you might be, not, you might need to be that guy who does that all the time, but. Yeah. Um, I think you know when he made uh, speeding like bullet to he to heaven and all that. Like he was still like lit at that time too, but then that was actually like one of the worst projects he actually like released. Based on critics. Yeah. And like I'm not gonna lie, there's not a lot of songs I feel on that. Uh, Adventure is the song I feel the most. I still play that back to back. Adventure is an amazing song. Speeding bullet to heaven. I couldn't take the whole project in, but. Adventures, like. And so right now we're gonna get back onto you know more of the music stuff like right now. So you have your new EP out right now. Before you ask why, available for download, streaming, all platforms. Before you ask why, so when making that like specific project, like what was the creative process for that EP, and what inspired you to make it in that sense? So the creative process for this was, um, I have this issue where I shelve a lot of tracks. And going into this one, I wanted to find out what was the median in between making all these, all these songs, but also not letting time pass enough to where I don't put it up. And that's my biggest problem. I let too much time go by, and then I don't want to put out those songs because they don't encompass the period of where, which I'm living in my life right now. It just doesn't, it doesn't match up. So I thought about it and knowing that that was my problem. This time around, I was like, yo, I'm going to make these songs. I'm not going to rush them to put them up, but I also got to move with a sense of urgency, regardless of what's going on, what's happening, whatever. So I worked on, I think it was about like, it was a few songs, it was a few songs. Um, I chose these three out of maybe like 20 songs. And I decided I'm going to put these up because these three encompass a period which I can still relate to and it's still very relevant. So I decided to put these out and then live out that situation. Yeah, most definitely. Like there was like this iconic line in like one of the songs too, like how you were born in like my era or like how you, you were even, how, how are you not even from the hood or how are you from the not hood and like not know what like... Mm -hmm. So what, what I said was, um, how the fuck you come from where I'm from and don't know Billie Jean? Yeah. 
Yeah. How the fuck you come from where I'm from? And yeah. yeah. That was that whole Billy. That was the whole uh, that Michael Jackson reference. Like, how, how do you come from where I'm from and not have these same influences and, and ambitions? And yeah. you know what I mean? Because I know a lot of people who either came from where I came from or came from even tougher situations yeah. and just don't have this drive to wanna grab something, move something, change something, shift something, draw something, paint something. There's just no ambition to pick up anything and do anything based on anything at all. Yeah. So that those two lines were like, how the fuck you come from where I'm from and don't know things like Billy Jean? Like how the fuck you come from where I'm from and like don't got any dreams? Like how how is that even possible? Yeah. Like yeah. it's like, you know, like even with the project all together, you know, like it talks a lot about like you know, just questioning like certain people's like motives and actions and all that and like yeah. also like looking into your own mindset like on like this is like what I wanna do, like this is like how I wanna see it, like in that sense. As much as I'm questioning other people, yeah. those questions are for me too. Like yeah. And like even from like that EP, which is like I think your first official EP that you released, to like from that all the way before until like when you f made your first song and like performing at Blues Fest, mm -hmm. did you ever felt that you've grown as an artist from that time you performed at Blues Fest to the EP until now in that sense? A hundred percent, a lot. I've grown a lot as an artist. I got it. That's hard to figure out where to start. I've grown a lot as an artist, like especially my creative process, how I even see um, my growth now and where I want to be. I've grown a lot as an artist, yeah. A lot of that naive, I guess, mentality I have is gone, but there's still this sense of, I guess, naive that you got to keep, to keep it fresh and keep it new. You know, like one iconic thing that I've actually noticed is that you always like wear like, uh, side mask and all that, like, you know, more of a face mask, but like not yeah. covering like the full on areas. Not, not the full on, no, nah, because this is, you know what it is? A lot of people wear a balaclava to cover their yeah. face like fully like this yeah. to, you know, do whatever they got to do. But for me, this is more of, um, the, it's the parallel between art and war. So balaclavas have been in history since First World War, Second World War. They also, balaclavas, if people don't know, are extension of like the chain mill and everything like that. The thing is with art and war and even design and, and fashion is we carry these from street culture. Yeah. Balaclavas come from street culture. Balaclavas were made before street culture. So if you're wearing one of these, it's literally to protect your face from cold anything. So the, the, diff, the parallel between the, the art and war is can you create this art without being at war with something? And I feel like people rocking this is in war, in war times, whether it was World War One, World War Two, even before then, um, they were fighting with these during war, but they were wearing it at home for fashion, which is what we're doing now. But it's been a thing where this is rocked during war to fight, but it's being rocked at home for fashion. Yeah. Yeah. So, what made you want to incorporate that like, in, in your artistry, like at face value, like when you're performing a song or yeah. when like you're out in public, you're doing a show, like you're wearing like the face mask and all that. One, I wanted to wear this because it's not about the face that's presenting it. It's like I want people to hear what's being said, like in the lyrics and everything. I don't want like people coming up and be like, "Yo, that was really dope what you did." Da -da. It's like if if you didn't even know that it was me, what would be the conversation centered around everything? Would you turn over to the person next to you? And be like, yo, in terms of this one, two lines, like, how do you feel about that? As opposed to like, yo, that was really dope. And they're hailing me up like a god or something. You know what I mean? I want you to turn to the person next to you and have a conversation. Two, I wanted to ask the question, can you create this dope art? Can you create amazing art without being at war with something? You get what I'm saying? Bella Clavis, I feel like are art at this point. The amount of Bella Clavis and the variations and how it's made are beautiful. Can that be created without... It's history of war. Can we still rock this and, you know, how I bleach this and make this, da -da? can this be made and rocked and worn without street war? Yeah. Um, so, mm. like, I know, like, even with artists that do it, like, to cover their face wise, like, you know, with Lake Ailey, uh, 47, with Rumor, uh, with uh, MF Doom, like, even mm. though he wasn't wearing, like, a like an actual like ba bakla like a uh, balkava and all that like he was wearing like an actual like mask. face yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so and you even be, but you avoid so much doing yeah. it like a lot 
I do feel like, you know, it creates like that whole like mystique too and to develop like artistry more in that sense too. And even artists like they'll try to mimic it like they'll try to like mimic it <laughs> mimic it, sorry about that, like in a more unique way, so like they'll have like a shadow or they'll kinda be like faceless for a bit so you won't know like what they actually like look like. I know her, uh, you know, back in like 2017, 2016, you know, like whenever she would drop a project or when she would uh, release music, you know, mm -hmm. like aside from the sunglasses, you know, like she would be like, you know, with a heavy like shadow, like in her physique and all that. So mm -hmm. you could only see like the silhouette of her body and all that at that time too. Um, Emotional Oranges, like an R&B uh, group, uh, I think out of the States, um, they would also do that same th thing too. Like, you know, and they still do it like now because you know, you don't want to know, like, what they look like in that sense, too. Like, even, like, in the shows, you don't know what they look like, you know, so... Because yeah. it changes a lot, especially for female artists. I can see that, I like, I can see them doing it more than, like, a male artist. Because it's, like, I don't know, niggas just focus on body and everything. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I could, I could wear it to be, like, mysterious, but, like, as some females, maybe they don't want to focus on being their look. Maybe they don't want to be over-sexualized, so they wear that to be, like, focus on the music. You know what I mean? I can understand a female artist wanting to wear that or cover you know any type of look based on people just based on her wanting maybe people to just respect the music before even knowing her look nah, I'm still um do you feel like even like with that look all together like with the like the baklavas and all that with the face masks with the silhouette shadows and all that do you feel like more people get the artistry like more like it creates like a better sense of like artistry from these artists like rather than just like showing like face and that's i feel like yes because you you can't ask further questions about a person's look yeah. you know what i mean like the questions about a person's look can only go so far because they have this mask on yeah. before you start turning to just the music you know what i mean like you'll hear the music like rumors one example he still hasn't revealed his face but it's just the artistry that's gonna speak for itself. And there's only so many questions you could ask about the mask before you decide to either take in the music or not take in the music. Yeah, I definitely agree in that sense too. Um, you know, you had this uh, one song right now called uh, Phenomenalist, and I think like, you know, that song like kind of like speaks for itself in that sense too, so. 100%. Just, uh, kinda, like... that's, a, that's a lifetime, lifelong thing right there. Phenomenalist. It's gotta come naturally. Yeah. Much, man. So I know, like, you know, you talked a lot about that in that song too. But in your own like perspective, please define like what a phenomenalist is and what traits would you consider that would fit like in that role. A phenomenalist is someone who does something at a certain level, at a high level, to where it's catered to you. So being a phenomenalist is something very personal to you. So whether it's working for the highest position in your job, whether it's working to be at the highest level in the industry, whether it's working to get to the highest level of your artistry, being a phenomenalist is getting to that point of the highest level of whatever you're doing, but you gotta make sure to keep that certain like, like swag. You gotta bring you to the table at the same time. So if you're going for the high position in the office of where you work, like it's not just going for the high position and getting it, cool. But did you bring that like element of you to the grind leading up to that. Like, do everything phenomenally. You know what I mean? Like, like, the phenomenalist part comes from you as an individual person. So you can only add that. So no one else can define what a phenomenalist means for you. You gotta bring that to your story because your story of how you got from point A to point Z, wherever you see that, is literally catered to you. Yeah, almost definitely. And you know, like even in that sense too, like we could even say like people like in the music industry, like anyone who's ever like made it like in that sense is a phenomenalist if they took it to like a higher level of whether it's like... And they did it their way. Yeah. Like Wiz is one person where I have some homies who say Wiz fell off. To me, I feel like Wiz is in the best part of his career. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And he did it. That, that's a phenomenalist. <laughs> Wiz is a phenomenalist. Ye, also a phenomenalist. But between those two people, like Wiz and Ye, very different people. Very different people. But they both did their thing phenomenally and did it with a phenomenalist mentality, in my opinion. And that's what a phenomenalist is. Oh yeah, phenomenalist, definitely, man. And um, as well, like, can you also define like what selling trauma means to you? Like, I know that you've had like part one and two, like with the songs like out right now, like on all streaming services, but. Can you just like define it in that sense and if it plays like a big role for you or anyone else in society? 
100 percent. so selling trauma the concept of selling trauma is something that's very relevant to almost every and anybody um i got that concept from an interview i watched with vince staples and i forget who he was interviewing but he said uh black people sell trauma the best and the most and then i looked at it i was like between any immigrant whether it's asians mexicans uh Africans, whoever, whoever, any immigrant culture, any whatever, um, once you get into artistry or even telling your story, what we're doing is literally selling our trauma, especially artists. If you, if you paint because of what you've been through, if you make music because of what you've been through and you're trying to express that, but then you're putting a tag on this and you're selling it, what we're doing is selling our trauma, which is a very deep thing. So if you imagine, let's say you go to see a therapist and those therapy sessions are recorded. Now, if you take those therapy sessions and sell them, how many people would want to hear, let's say, Jessica Alba's therapy sessions? How many people would want to buy that as much as they maybe want to buy her sex tape? That therapy session is her trauma and what she's been through. I bet you a ton of people would want to buy her tape, along with a a million of other artists. So what, what we do with our artistry is we put our trauma on tracks, and then we also sell it, and we make money from it which is a beautiful thing, but it's also, I also made the selling trauma concept to let people know part one and part two are two very different vibes. Part one is way more introspective. Part two is more of like a, a lit vibe. You're in the club, you're whatever, you, you're doing your thing. You might not even take in the lyrics, but you gotta, you gotta keep in mind the lit shit that I'm saying on those tracks, whether I'm saying, cause I also, I also said lines like, um, smash that cruise, like, whoa, take my bitch back. No, take my words back. No. That's for me being through traumatic effects of something with involving my ex or any other girl I've been with. So I'm not just saying those lines to be like, oh, fuck my ex. It comes from, if I'm saying something like that, where does it come from? People might not take it in at the time while getting lit, but I just, I created, I created and went deeper on the selling trauma concept to let people know like this stuff comes from a deeper place than just trying to make a lit vibe or something with 808s that gets shit moving. Like these things come from somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And I noticed that you've quoted like Vince Staples like in that sense too, and like yeah. you explained it. Um, he actually did like another interview. I don't know if you've uh, watched it where he talked about like you know black people like being like entertainers, so yeah. people only care that black people like are entertainers in that sense too. But legit, or like, I I see it now. It's more, almost like a. It's almost like this card that gets you into places. It's like. I don't know, I get, this, I get this vibe sometimes where it's like, uh, it's like, you, okay, cool, you're black, but it's like, what are you black in? Like, what do you do? As opposed to just like, oh, hey, what's up, Charles? Or what up, you so, or, you know what I mean? Like, it's more like, oh, wait, so what do you do? Like, like how, how black are you? Like, what's this, like, this calling card to, like, you know? And, you know, like, this is kind of, like, more introspective in that sense, too. So, say, um, you don't even do music in that sense, too, or you, like, retwi- like retire from it, like, in that sense, too. Mm-hmm. Would people, like, care about you more, you know, if you were, like, a regular person rather than an artist? Or do you, fe- do you feel like it might be, like, the other way around? Like, you know, like, let's say, like, hey, I'm going to stop, like, making music and all that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to focus more on myself and all that. Do you feel like, like, the respect and, like you know, the care, like, decreases, like, in that sense, too? Like, for me personally? Uh, you know, this is just, like, an example. In general, um, I, th- I feel like uh, artists got to watch out for that. Artists, um, yeah, artists really got to watch out for that. There's a couple few other groups that got to watch out for that, but artists really got to watch out for that. Um, you're used to people. I feel like you can really start to define your use to people when you make yourself kind of useless to people. Then you can realize where people really hold you and what your, I guess your 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 economic meaning to someone is. Yeah, um, so because I do feel like you know like even in that sense too like we could talk about like rappers like all day in that sense too like let's say you know you don't fit into any of these like tropes like you're not a rapper you're not a person like selling drugs or doing like illegal means to get by you're not doing sports you're not like you know doing like cloud type stuff you know like for youtube and all that like you're not like a youtuber know that you're not like a socialite and all that you're not like big on like social media you're just like a regular like square dude like working nine to five and all that people people could really look at you like 
yeah, there's, especially in the industry, people could look at you like, what's your use to me? Like, <laughs> you don't do any of these things. But a music appreciator is a big thing. Getting an opinion from a music appreciator who doesn't even, especially the ones who don't even dabble in what you do, like the music you make. Like, I've had people who've never listened to, like, the type of music I make, but their opinion is like, whoa. Like, you had enough, you, you had enough of a thought to develop this opinion about something you, you don't even really fuck with. So, yeah. I want to get more into, like, Bartlett House stuff for a bit, too. Like, I know, like, we're right now in this, like, Bartlett House, like, location. Like, I'm wearing the shirt that, you know, I won from, from the EP. It looks good. Yeah. good. It looks good, my yeah, guy. Man, like, I actually, like, like it in that sense, too. I like the design, like, the meshing, like, the color waves and all that. So, honestly, I'm going to wear this for a while now, you know, so. Appreciate that, <laughs> yeah, man, man. Appreciate that, man. But, yo, tell me more about, uh, you know, your affiliation with Bartlett House and, like, how that came about. Bartlett House came about from, um, I guess, like, frustration it was at a point where i thought i thought um all these sanctions of the masks and the pandemic and everything was coming to an end but then new rules would come up but we were also very much towards the end and i had just moved into this place with two of my roommates captive and doesn't matter it's okay thank god i moved in here with them because when i proposed the idea to them of how would you feel about throwing events in here and making that happen and they were cool with it. They make music too. They're also artists themselves too. So in terms of noise and events, like that's their forte. It's more like, can I get a slot type thing, if anything, you know? So we did one of our first little, I guess I would call it like a little jam, more like a gathering. That's when I met Osaze and Lee. And off of that conversation and that vibe and how we click there, we decided, yo, let's do more events. Let's visualize this place as a thing to do because venues aren't open right now. So up until venues do open can we cultivate our own people to bring back out into the world like yo this is us this is what we've been building now let's branch off into here and on top of that bartless bartlett is also a place it's a place to call home 100 percent. definitely 100 percent a place to call yeah most definitely do you feel like it's more of a safe space for creatives like to blossom like in a sense too yes 100 percent um the long-term goal is to be able to say the artist development is there that's like a, a long-term goal to where I can say, yeah, we do that. But it is a safe space. It is a safe space where people can blossom and realize their full potential. Most definitely, man. And, you know, we just have, like, these uh, last uh, few questions uh, right here for a bit, too. So how do you feel about, like, the Toronto Canadian music scene, like, right now at the moment? Do you feel like that there should be some changes on the direction of where the scene should go to? Or you feel like, or you feel like it's fine the way it is? Honestly, I would say I'm the wrong person to ask for that. Um, I'm someone who came into the Toronto music scene. In terms of the Canadian music scene, I like the direction it's headed. I also am still trying to work my direction and see where that's going. And that's also a super fun and, I guess, naive new brain to where I'm trying to figure that out. So that feels good. But um, the scene, I feel like, is going in a good direction to where it's, it's blossoming more and people are being seen more. Rolling Loud, Rolling Loud Toronto is like released uh, last uh, throughout this week. Um, they had like the headliners day, Future Wizkid, a lot of like dope talent from Toronto, Ottawa, all these other places too. Like, how do you feel about that? That was that was pretty cool actually. Um, I seen a homie posted on his story, and I didn't know why he posted. I was like, oh, dope, Rolling Loud is back again. I know it's a dope festival. I did a double take. I went back on the story and I seen that it was in Toronto, and I was like, whoa. That is, that's, that's, that's touchable. That's like right here. Yeah. Rolling Loud is this thing that we always know to be, you know, in the States and whatnot, but it's here. It's, you know what I mean? There's, there's a lot that can happen from that. Yeah. A lot. I think pe people should see it as an opportunity as much as, um, I've seen people talking about, um, why isn't this person on the bill? Why isn't this person on the bill? I think it's a great opportunity for everybody, even if you're not on the bill. You're in the city period yeah i do feel like you know even in that sense too like i'm gonna add like my 10 cents on it so um mm -hmm. it creates like a lot of opportunity in all of the streams too like everywhere just like how like the 2016 nba like all stars happen happened in toronto you know like mm -hmm. it created opportunities for clubs to be open for like out of entertainment places like strip clubs to like open have like people do like you know sit-ins like meeting groups meeting and greets and all that club mm -hmm. nights type stuff too you know it brings like revenue like to Toronto like to help the economy because that's what like John Tory said like a while back that he wanted like the city of Toronto to do and you know more opportunities for artists to create music too like because 
in a sense too, like not a lot of these artists that come to Toronto on a regular basis, you know? Yeah. Or if so, they, they're on tour, but like they're not seeing the city as much, you know? But you hear it though, they fuck with, they fuck with the city, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you hear it in the music. Most definitely. Yeah. But like even in that sense too, I do feel like Rolling Loud will be good in that sense too. Um, I feel like people are just kind of like over like sensationalizing it like in the police sense because of the notoriety of the artists that are performing that are from the city and all that but i do feel like even with the extra security needed with the allocation of certain artists like if they have like any other like issues and stuff like that like added on like different dates and all that and even just like giving opportunities for people like out of like Toronto and all that, you know, people in Ottawa, Montreal, Vancouver coming to Toronto, you know, it's actually gonna be more inclusive, you know, for all Canadian artists like in that sense too, so. Rolling Loud, super, super important that's, that's happening here. We're at a very great point in the city right now that's happening here. Right. Are you planning on uh, getting like tickets soon uh, for Rolling Loud or? 100%, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there one way or another, I'm gonna be there. You're gonna see me, whether it's in the stands, um, you know, you're you're gonna see me there. Yeah, you're, you're gonna see me there. Yeah. Uh, with everything else uh, going on right now, do you have any regrets of your own, or do you regret nothing in that? No, I have I have like temporary regrets, but if anybody knows me, like I I don't regret anything. I have temporary regrets. I think the the most the most temporary regret that I ever have is oh I wish I didn't meet this person and this person. But after sitting down and taking it in, I don't regret that. I really don't regret that. Everybody was essential. All my experiences were essential to leading to where I was, or where I am right now, sitting here, where I want to be, you know? So, yeah, I have temporary regrets, but no. Not, no, no actual, tangible, like, full regrets. Like, I wish this never happened, or I wish I never did this or went through this. Okay. Um, you know, speaking on these, like, temporary regrets for a bit too, like, if you were to like amend with that specific person in that sense too, would you feel like it would have like worked out like in that sense too? Or do you feel like, you know, there's no going back to like amending with people like forgive and forget in that sense? I don't think there's a, there's a going back and mending, but I do also think that the situation you and said person went through pushed it to a point where it needed to be the whole time maybe and maybe you and said person were kind of like pushing it off to the side maybe because of emotions or your long time friendship or something but i feel like it pushes it pushes it to a place where it needs to be whether you or the other person realize it but i don't feel like like cutting someone off or something like that is like super super necessary it's just it's growth from a certain point of okay this is where we're at now things might not ever be what they were but i'm okay with that this is, this is where it needs to be. And it might not involve us being around each other as much as we were before, but... You know what I mean? Like, no, I definitely know what you mean, almost definitely. So, uh, what's uh, next uh, for you? So, in terms of any of the music coming up, other creative projects and so forth, yeah. and do you have any like, final words you'd like to say for any creative or any person out there pursuing their dreams? Yeah. I would say i um, working on a 10-track project. I want to give a date on that, but there's other elements that are out of my control pertaining to releasing that. So I will say I'm working on a 10 track project. In terms of what's coming out recent or soon, I'm working on a video for each song on the Before You Ask Why EP. Uh, we're going to have Lee on the videos, uh, Diego on the videos, Gabby on the videos, everybody's on the videos. Uh, I got three videos coming out, got the interview coming out, I got some shows, some really, really dope shows coming out really super important shows. Bartlett is popping too with some dope shows. Um, 100%, 100%. We're working on some shit. There's a lot coming up, yeah. yeah. We're, closing, we're closing this year out like phenomenally, like a signature. Yeah. And you know, if any person like out there that wants to pursue like the same stuff like that you're doing or- Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't or... do it. No, I'm playing, I'm playing. Shoot for the stars, but yeah. Most mm -hmm. it, uh, what were you saying, if anybody? Like, you know, the question was basically, like, if you have any, like, fun words you'd like to say for any creative or any person, you know, like, that's planning on doing something in their life, whether it's a square trying to finish up, like, their degree in university or, like, someone that's trying to get, like, their big job, like, right now, like, do you have any, like, 
words you'd like to say for any like person like in that sense or any like creative you know like in your like scene pursuing like their dreams in that sense i would say one thing is um in terms of opinions taking opinions from different people um know which person you're getting that opinion from an opinion doesn't have to be a fact so regardless it may be your mom your wife girlfriend best friend, acquaintance, take in those opinions, but let it apply to your life how it would apply to you. You decide where that opinion applies itself. If it doesn't apply itself, but that's literally up to you. Even, even your parents couldn't even decide that for you. It's literally you living in your own body that'll decide that. So opinions are a big thing. Opinions and fact. Um, in terms of anything else, like a, what I would leave them with is it is what it is. Until it is what it isn't, it's always going to be what it's going to be. And, yeah, it is what it is. It's always going to be what it is. And try your best out of any situation, any instance with anybody, try your best to make sense of it. Always. Always try to make sense of it. It's okay to want to make sense of it. No, um, most definitely. Uh, you so you know. Thank you for coming by. You know, and like even having like this like wonderful conversation. Like I know thank that you. you're you. a person who loves and values the conversation in that sense too. And I'm glad that you know this really isn't just like an interview. This is more of a conversation. Of a conversation. I just wanted to talk. I hear, I even told you that before. I'm like, yo, as long as you can pull up and we can just. just if we can talk, yeah. I'm down to talk. Yeah. And even like the topics that you know we even talked about. You know, like more so with. Like finding paths, you know, like if like paths like were different, like well, would the respect come through, you know, like even just like you know your hometown, like even in those discussions too, mm. even like just you know Ottawa versus Toronto in that sense too, or even just like the music too, like you know with selling trauma with the phenomenalist the conversation too, like we had like a lot of, you know, there's like a lot of like interesting thoughts too, like musically, you know, and like even like just in this conversation too, and I feel like this is something that was like really needed like in that sense too and i'm glad that we even had that in that sense too so and you know thank you for coming by you know like for having like this very like dope conversation i'm not gonna say interview no. even though it's an interview but it's a conversation yeah, but conversation. I'm, I'm afraid of interviews <laughs> i can only be honest yeah I'm, I'm i'm afraid of interviews super afraid of interviews but conversations i'm down for yeah, most definitely, man. I mean, thank you for coming by. You know, I wish nothing but the best for you for the Bartlett House family. I know, like, with this place right now, it looks very unique with the artwork, mm -hmm. with the cat walking around, and with everything else going on too. Like, a lot of interesting stuff uh, by there too. And you know, you know, before you ask why the EP, it's out now on all like streaming platforms: 100%. Apple Music, uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, More YouTube. You know. Look out for those videos. Before you ask why, already here, we got Brazen, 4 a.m., hence. Um, if you're seeing this interview, let me, if you're seeing this conversation, sorry, let me know which one you feel the most. You can find me at Make Sense of It. Yeah. All right. And um, I don't know if you want to do like any other like shout outs for any other uh, people like that helped out with this process too. Man, I would, there's, there's always a ton of people involved in the process. I'm not going to mention any names because I know I'm going to leave one out. That's my whole thing with that. I, I can't mention specifically because I'm gonna leave one out, for sure. Like for sure, for sure. If I start to list people off, yeah. But you know who you are. You 100% know who you are. There's a lot of people involved with, even just even people who didn't have a direct hand in the project itself. Just you being around was an inspiration and a motivation. So there's a lot of people, a lot of people. Just just know it's never just an individual thing. It's never just me at face value, and it's just him and he decided to do this and wake up and that was just it. There's always a ton of people. And if you're, if you're in the mix, if you come and see what it is, you'll see all the people involved. You'll know it's not just a one-man thing. You know? It can't be. It's impossible. Most definitely, man. Well, you know, until next time, man, and hopefully I wish you all the best, you know? Thank you, man. I appreciate that. All right. Peace, man. Lens of Yeshu. All right. <laughs>